So to start off, I would first like to introduce Lisa Maragakis, an Associate Professor of Medicine and Epidemiology and the Senior Director of Infection Prevention at the Johns Hopkins Health System and the Hospital Epidemiologist for the Johns Hopkins Hospital. In these roles, she is responsible for the conceptualization, planning, implementation, and development of the Johns Hopkins Health System's Infection Control and Prevention Program. Lisa is the Incident Commander for the Johns Hopkins Medicine COVID-19 Response. In addition, she is the co-chair of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Healthcare Infection Control Practices Advisory Committee, or HICPAC, H-I-C-P-A-C. Also joining us is Ben Larman, Assistant Professor of Pathology and member of the Johns Hopkins Institute for Cell Engineering. He directs the Laboratory of Precision Immunology in the Pathology Department. His laboratory develops and deploys new technologies to study the human immune system and its response to environmental exposures. And finally, I'd like to introduce, reintroduce, I should say, Carolyn Mockamer, Professor of Cell Biology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. She has been on the Johns Hopkins faculty since 1988 and is one of the world's experts on the assembly mechanism of coronaviruses. So welcome to you, all three of you. First, I'd like to ask each of you to say a few words about what you have been focusing on in the past few months during the pandemic and what you envision will be happening through the summer. So uh, Lisa, we'll start off with you. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to participate today and, um, and uh, hosting this panel, which I think is, is uh, of course, a very timely topic. So as you mentioned, in my role, I am responsible for infection prevention in our hospital and our um, health system. And as such, it fell to me and my team to begin preparations for a pandemic response in Johns Hopkins Medicine and our surrounding community uh, once we became aware in December of 2019 that this uh, threat was emerging uh, in China. And so um, my team and I have really been working since uh, mid-January, um, actually early January, uh, taking our pandemic planning, uh, which did exist because for a long time, uh, we and other uh, professional uh, professionals have known that a pandemic of respiratory virus was, one, was among the most likely uh, scenarios that we would face. And so uh, we, like many other institutions, had pandemic response plans. Um, however, uh, like many uh, other organizations, once we were faced with the, the threat, we realized uh, that we needed a lot more detail on the, the skeleton of our pandemic plan. And that is really what has consumed our, uh, our team since, uh, since January. We did a variety of things, including acquisition of personal protective equipment, uh, as well as learning everything that we could about the virus and the clinical syndrome that was emerging and um, making quite detailed plans about patient placement and staffing patterns in our hospital and health system so that we were prepared, um, particularly given the possibility that this virus could be transmitted by the airborne route, uh, we had to do a number of preparations to ensure that we had the air handling capabilities to create um, mm -hmm. negative pressure respiratory isolation units to safely care for these patients and to focus on personal protective equipment so that we had um, that available to keep our staff uh, safe as well. So our early planning focused on that. And then uh, once our uh, country experienced the first cases, um, our role really expanded to partnering with colleagues across the uh, organization to uh, ready our hospitals and, and really, I will say, to transform healthcare delivery from stem to stern um, by providing telemedicine to ambulatory patients uh, to help uh, provide information to the worried well and to the mildly ill, setting up testing tents so that we could provide uh, testing 
and um, to both patients who, who needed to come to the hospital as well as those who did not. Uh, and, uh, and then our response has, has really gone on from there. And there are many different aspects to it. Uh, I think that um, we have faced a number of challenges. Many of, uh, of those challenges have been detailed extensively uh, in the, the media reports, um, but they are very real. The supply chain challenges, the um, shortages of the very basic things that you would need to fight an infectious disease, like uh, laboratory reagents, personal protective equipment, and even uh, hand sanitizer and disinfectant. So it's really been quite a journey, uh, partnering with um, uh, industry in some cases, with public health officials, and with experts across our own organization to develop innovative solutions uh, to keep our patients and our staff safe and, um, and to provide the care to the patients um, that are needed. Of course, during this, there have been a number of clinical innovations um, and a lot of research uh, that is ongoing to this day that has really, I think, um, helped to advance the, um, the knowledge about this clinical syndrome, the care of patients with it, and uh, we learn more every day and uh, have a number of clinical trials as well as basic science uh, research studies underway uh, at Johns Hopkins Medicine. So I think uh, I will stop there and, and look forward to, uh, to your questions. Thank you. Okay, splendid. Thank you very much. Uh, ben, would you like to go next? Sure. I prepared a couple of slides. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen. Is that working? Yes. Great. Well, thank you, James. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to participate today. Um, as you mentioned, uh, my lab is, is devoted to the development of new techniques for monitoring uh, human immune responses. And uh, when the pandemic uh, you know, began in the United States, we really uh, devoted our efforts to developing, applying these uh, technologies that we've been working on to COVID-19. And I'd like to share with you today two uh, techniques that we've been developing. Uh, one to look at, um, sorry, one to look at the first phase of the infection, which involves uh, the replication of the virus in the host and where uh, detecting the virus and understanding it there uh, at the level of, of uh, genetics or antigen uh, is important. Uh, what's shown here, this early phase of the infection. Uh, on to the second phase of the infection when the immune system kicks in and is able to clear the virus so that what's going on, what's interesting to look at are the antibodies. Uh, that's one interesting thing to look at and understand how the host is responding to uh, clearing the infection. So my lab uses um, what's called next generation DNA sequencing, which is an incredibly powerful technology. I'm sure you've heard lots about uh, used to sequence the human genome, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but really at its core, this technology generates hundreds of millions of DNA sequence reads uh, in a given instrument run. And what we try to do is use that as the back end for reading out molecular assays that we develop. So I'm going to tell you about two today, one that's devoted to reading out uh, RNA molecules from the virus, uh, and it can also be used to read out uh, messages uh, in, the, in the host gene expression uh, in the tissues that are also uh, being infected. This is an assay called CRASL-seq. And then I'll also share with you a little bit of work that we're doing to profile antibodies using a technique called bacteriophage display. So in the first technology, uh, this is basically a probe-based technique to uh, measure target RNA sequences. And at the heart of the assay are these ligation probes. They're pieces of DNA that are designed to bind a specific sequence in the target uh, adjacent to one another, so that only when they're next to each other can they become ligated enzymatically, joining this into one molecule that can then be amplified and, using PCR and uh, analyzed 
uh, and we use uh, DNA sequencing to analyze it. There's also a, another probe here that we use to capture the target RNA molecules, and that's got a little tag on it called biotin, uh, which can be efficiently captured with uh, beads uh, that are coated with something that binds to biotin. So this is a, the workflow, and uh, it all starts with a sample uh, coming in, like a nasopharyngeal swab, uh, for instance, that uh, many people have already heard about. And what this, uh, the, the first step is to mix the swab or buffer with a, a large set of probes. And one of the really neat features of this technology is that we can put in thousands of probes at the same time to look at thousands of targets. And then once the binding is allowed to happen, we can then capture out all those target molecules uh, using these magnetic beads. We perform the ligation so that these become single molecules, and then we can amplify uh, those ligation products using uh, DNA primers that have sample-specific barcodes on them. And this is important because it allows us to mix together thousands of samples into uh, one reaction that goes on to the next generation uh, sequencing instrument. So this is a technology that is uh, developed to be fundamentally scalable uh, in terms of not only the number of targets that can be analyzed, but also the number of samples that can be analyzed. So, you know, we've developed panels to very sensitively detect um, SARS-CoV-2 um, and host responses. Uh, but one of the really neat things that we've done that I'll share with you today has been to design probes that are uh, specifically geared towards defining uh, genetic variants in the virus. And so there's a set of uh, variants across the genome of the virus that have uh, developed over time as the virus has spread over the world. Um, and, and these sort of define the ancestral lineages of the virus. So we just designed as a proof of concept uh, probes to recognize about 20 of these uh, variants and then tested this on a set of 40 uh, nasopharyngeal swabs that were obtained at Johns Hopkins. And by comparing all of the variants to each other and um, asking the question, how many independent uh, transmission lines are uh, observed among this set of uh, 40 individuals, we, we can see that there's at least nine uh, independent lines. So this is pretty interesting. It tells us how much diversity is actually already in our community uh, and also suggests uh, ways in which this type of a technique could be useful um, in, in terms of molecular tracing, contact tracing uh, situations where it's important to know, you know, is there one cluster of outbreak or are there multiple clusters uh, in the same uh, outbreak? So I'll switch gears now and just tell you briefly about the antibody profiling that we're doing with a platform called uh, Bacteriophage Display that I've been working on ever since I did my PhD with Steve Elledge uh, many years ago. And the way this works is uh, we utilize uh, bacteriophage, these are viruses that infect bacteria, and we can engineer them by inserting a piece of DNA into their genome so that they can express on their surface a protein fragment uh, that we encode with that piece of DNA that we put in there. And this allows you to use DNA technologies, which are very powerful, to uh, understand antibody binding to these protein fragments. So we, we use advances in DNA synthesis to create libraries of DNA molecules that encode protein fragments that can span across all these different uh, uh, proteomes. And we've made human proteomes, we've made a mouse proteome, uh, et cetera. And today I'll tell you about um, a library that we've made that spans all human coronaviruses. And then the other powerful thing that we can do is use DNA sequencing to read this out after we use the antibodies uh, to interrogate the library. So just in a little bit more detail, we've taken all the genome sequences for all the known human coronaviruses, including SARS, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2, and basically designed these libraries to have protein fragments that span across 
all of these proteins encoded in these viruses. Uh, these are 56 amino acid uh, peptide tiles that overlap each other by 28 amino acids, and they tile across each protein. And there's about 3,500 of these uh, peptide tiles it takes to cover all the human coronaviruses. So once we have the design, we then synthesize the DNA and then uh, clone it in a single pool into the phage library. And we can expand it and use it uh, to profile antibodies from donors. And it takes very little uh, serum or plasma, less than a drop of blood uh, from a donor. And we mix that with the library, allow the antibodies to bind their targets. And then again, we use magnetic beads to pull out all the antibodies uh, along with the phage uh, that are bound to those antibodies. And then we amplify out those sequences uh, by PCR, and then again, uh, add sample-specific uh, DNA barcodes onto those uh, PCR products so that everything can be pulled together and sequenced uh, on an Illumina instrument. That's our uh, platform of choice. And at the end of the day, using informatics pipelines, for, we can deconvolute the data and say for each sample, these were the sets of peptide reactivities uh, that we observed uh, based on the binding to the phage. Uh, and I'll share with you just one data set to give you a flavor of uh, what kind of information comes out of this. Uh, this is an individual, uh, this is one individual sampled over time at these time points, uh, days uh, since symptom onset. And um, each point here is a peptide, and along the y axis is how reactive it was to this particular patient. And the peptides are colored by the protein they are derived from. So red is spike protein, uh, green is nucleocapsid, and blue is ORF1. And so what you can see is that at about day seven uh, or after, uh, we start to see reactivity to the spike protein coming up. Um, and what's sort of cool is that we can look at lots of different uh, coronaviruses at the same time and so, for instance, uh, these are the four common cold causing coronaviruses. OC43 is the other beta coronavirus that's most, co most closely related to SARS-CoV-2. And we see um, even more seemingly reactivity to spike protein in this uh, coronavirus, suggesting that perhaps in this individual, the COVID-2 infection elicited a memory response that was pre-existing in this individual uh, to OC43 that would uh, be useful or not in responding to the COVID-2 infection. And so we're hoping to use this type of a technology to understand what is it about people's prior exposures uh, that, uh, that alter the trajectory of their immune response to SARS-CoV-2 uh, and, and impact the uh, severity of their clinical course. So I'll just stop there and uh, just uh, briefly thank uh, the funding uh, agencies that have made this work possible over the last uh, few years. Um, and throwing my contact information up there, please uh, don't hesitate to get in touch and I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Great, thank you very much, Ben. Okay, so uh, Carolyn, do you care to say a few more words? Yeah, I'll just say a few words. I think the question was, what have I been doing since January in terms of COVID? Um, basically, I've been serving in, in an advisory role, uh, educating my colleagues and colleagues around the world about coronaviruses. I've been reviewing grants and papers and serving on advisory boards <clears throat> for, <clears throat> excuse me, for the internal working groups that we have now. Um, Ironically, I would, I'm trying to retire. <laughs> this was supposed to be when my lab would be closing. Um, so uh, we still have some experiments to do to finish off some projects, but I'm not actively going to be working um, on SARS coronavirus too. That's really all I have to say as an introduction, if you heard my talk earlier. Okay, great, thank you. So, um, I'd like to begin with a few questions for each of you, and then we'll move on to take questions from our attendees that are being posted to the Q&A section. Um, so people have already started to enter those, those questions. That's great. Please continue to, to do so. 
So Lisa, I'm going to start with you. Um, I'd like to ask you a question that I think many, is on many of our minds. Um, what's your sense of the COVID-19 response in the US in general? How effective has it been? What have we done right? And where can we improve? Oh, well, that is a, a loaded question. Um, you know, I, I guess much as I did in my earlier comments, I would start by uh, looking at what we did to prepare before this, um, this occurred. So uh, that is one of the things that I would put in the category of what we did uh, right, uh, but also I think we have learned that we could improve, and that is pandemic uh, pl planning in general. So a lot of work has gone on for a number of years um, for pandemic planning. Uh, there's so many things to consider, um, including um, acquisition and stockpiling of scarce resources, um, surge planning for uh, ventilators and, uh, and other equipment as well as um, the other types of things that I described in terms of um, procedures and infection prevention guidelines. So I, I think a lot of that existed. I think a lot of uh, drills and, uh, and practice sessions had occurred. I would point to one other uh, thing that I think really did strengthen our ability to respond, and that was the um, infrastructure and funding that was um, uh, put forward in the response to the Ebola crisis in 2014 and 2015. And so um, here at Johns Hopkins Medicine, I can tell you that we uh, participated uh, greatly in that. And I know healthcare uh, facilities around the world responded to that infectious disease crisis by preparing and recognizing the global nature of infectious disease transmission uh, so that we had put in place travel screening uh, and protocols so we would be aware when patients with particular risk factors presented to our healthcare facilities. Um, and um, the funding uh, from the Assistant Secretary of Preparedness and Response for the National uh, Ebola Training um, Center, or NETEC, and a system of uh, 10 biocontainment units that are spread through the 10 uh, ASPR regions throughout the United States, uh, really uh, formed a backbone of infrastructure uh, that had not existed before, um, or at least it was not as robust. And so we, we have been able to build upon this. Um, and, and it's not just those biocontainment units, but really all of the training and preparation protocols, and quite frankly, um, you know, expertise and relationships that are built uh, when such funding is put into a public health uh, infrastructure so that we um, work very closely with public health officials and, and build uh, relationships and protocols that we can rely upon when an emergency like this strikes. So, so those are some of the positives. Um, you know, I, I think we are all aware of the shortcomings, however, um, that did not live up. And, um, you know, first among them, I, I have to say that uh, the supply chain shortages uh, to which I uh, alluded earlier have just been a, a devastating uh, challenge when you're facing a, a life-threatening, overwhelming uh, infectious disease pandemic like this, um, it's really unthinkable uh, that we would be in a position where we do not have the very basics of personal protective equipment, um, hand sanitizer, disinfectant, and the reagents that are needed for the laboratory test. So uh, we have to um, really take a hard look uh, after this is over at the underlying reasons for that and make sure that that never happens again. And I, I do think that it is uh, an issue of um, uh, um, preparedness and investment in public health infrastructure uh, that will help uh, guard against that in the future. Great, thank you very much. Um, Carol, the next question is for you. So scientists are working to develop vaccines and treatments for the, corona, for the novel coronavirus, for SARS-CoV-2. Are there basic biological concepts that are informing their approaches? And what do we still need to understand about coronaviruses to develop the next generation of treatments? 
Yes, so there's definitely a foundation of work um, on which these activities are based. Um, there's some holes in the foundation, and that's largely due to just the lack of study of these viruses. Uh, prior to S SARS in 2002, there were very few um, labs studying coronaviruses, and there was a peak um, of funding after SARS that went away when the virus went away. And this happened again with the MERS virus. So um, the things we really don't know about the basic biology are the following. We don't really understand, we, what we do know, why don't I say that first, the a large amount of information based on the spike uh, protein structure and how it interacts with its receptor. Uh, we know about the, uh, the fusion mechanism by which the virus gains entry to the host cell. We know a lot about um, the replication of the virus. What we don't know much about is how that replication uh, occurs in a specialized compartment of the cell called replication organelle that the virus sets up. What we don't know is much about the, um, the assembly and egress that I spoke of earlier. And the main, the main question there is why? Why does the virus do this? Um, and then we also don't know uh, enough about these accessory proteins that are encoded between the structural genes that um, have a fair, uh, fairly well-known um, from other coronaviruses ability to counteract the host innate immune system. But there's, there's a lot of variation in these accessory proteins and um, there's not much known yet about SARS coronavirus two accessory proteins. Um, so I think, you know, my hope is that sustained funding will allow us to fill some of these basic holes in the biology, the understanding of the virus, because without understanding it completely, these treatments and potentially the vaccine, you know, you know we'll, we'll have issues because um, we need to know, we really do need to know um, much more about the basic biology. So. Thank you. Uh, ben, since your lab works on next generation diagnostic technologies, and we've heard so much about testing issues in the media, can you give us your thoughts on the current situation and our prospects going forward? Sure. So I think it's you know important to think about the in the early stages, the type of test that was used and is still used now, this PCR test, um, is so run of the mill in terms of laboratory testing. Um, you know, something that we do in my lab and many other molecular biology labs, you know, across the country every day. For us to see, um, you know, the problems associated with the initial rollout was just mind boggling and so disappointing. Um, and we were clearly unprepared as a nation to quickly scale up. Uh, these uh, types of tests um, and that requirement became more acute as more uh, cases uh, spread and you know so this is just so disappointing to think about in retrospect um, because of such far-reaching uh, consequences that we're dealing with now um, but I think there may be a silver lining uh, to this because there are so many cases now and everyone needs to get back to work and back to school and to everything else. Uh, so there's just this unprecedented need for massive molecular testing and contact tracing. And, um, and so, you know, with the amount of investment in meeting this challenge in terms of uh, not just capital, but talent and ideas, because, you know, everyone is uh, so focused on getting past this current crisis um, that I really expect there to be, um, you know, transformative technologies uh, that emerge from these efforts. And I think, you know, these will be used to uh, defeat this pandemic. Um, and, you know, they will be useful in the future as well. Uh, for meeting uh, other challenges. Um, I think they will be used for much more uh, surveillance uh, and you know, much faster and more robust responses to future outbreaks. 
Um, and so that's, that's where I see uh, the silver lining to the current uh, situation. Great, thank you. Okay, so thank you all three of you. So I'm now going to open um, this up for uh, questions from the audience. Uh, so the first one in is from John Davis, who asks, as journalists, how can we put in context the large gathering of public protests, the reopening of local economies, when it comes to writing about the uptick in COVID-19 cases? Anyone like to field that one? You know, I, I think this is a very difficult issue. Um, and um, the protests are, are one aspect of it, um, but as been mentioned, and we all know that there are so many things that are very uh, important uh, that each of us do every day. And, and so I guess I, I look at it um, all as, as a piece in, in the fact that we need to get back to our activities, but we have this, this big threat out there. And so um, much as we do on a daily basis, we have to do a risk assessment every, uh, every time and say, what, what is the bigger risk? And, um, and if something is essential and I must do it, how can I do it in the safest manner possible? And so, um, you know, these are the conversations that are playing out um, uh, as businesses reopen, uh, as we um, have been providing healthcare uh, in, and working in, in uh, the healthcare systems and many essential workers have, have been working throughout the pandemic um, faced with such a situation. And, you know, there, the fact is there, there is a way to take precautions. Um, we've seen universal masking. We know about social distancing. Um, and so it really comes down to the very basics of infection prevention and, and using what we do know about how the virus is transmitted to develop a strategy to try to block it from uh, going from person to person. And, and that is an imperfect science at best, um, but I think we're learning more and more about this. The protests specifically, you know, I think do worry many of us because we see the pictures of people in very close proximity to each other, um, but, but there are aspects of it that mitigate the risk, like the fact that they're outdoors. So I think, and some people are wearing masks and, and apparently trying to keep distance. So um, those are the only things that we can do in those situations. Okay, thank you. Um, so Jennifer Ciotti asks, can someone comment on the second wave that is predicted for the fall? Would this likely be due to characteristics of SARS-CoV-2 or to human behavior or some other set of factors? Again, a tough one. <laughs> Um, I, I can talk about the human behavior part, which is related to my answer, and then um, maybe Ben and, and Carolyn want to chime in about um, the characteristics of the virus itself. But um, in my view, um, I, I am worried about a second surge, and I, I'm actually concerned that the second surge may come uh, before we get to the fall. Um, I may be wrong about that, but I think the human behavior aspect of it um, is going to play a significant role. And even before the protests started, we saw um, frustration with uh, the lockdown. We saw people um, you know, on beaches and um, cell phone data that shows decreased social distancing overall. And when we look at a population level uh, to see how a, a region is doing, we're looking at things like hospitalizations, new cases, and deaths. And those numbers at a population level take a number of weeks to show a signal after a, a large scale behavior change has happened. So in my view, right now, we are um, seeing the numbers decrease in a number of areas. Certainly that's what we're seeing here in Maryland. And I think that that is a reflection of what happened in early April when we were at maximum social distancing and staying at home. 
Um, and we know that since that time, we've had a number of holidays, Mother's Day, Easter, Passover, uh, better weather, people uh, moving about, and then uh, the reopenings. And so I do expect that uh, even, even by the end of the summer, we're probably going to see the effects of that. Yeah, and I would say from a testing perspective that, you know, as I mentioned, I'm very optimistic that there will be transformative technologies developed that will help us uh, better track infections. Um, and, you know, everyone's heard about in the news, the massive um, amount of contact tracing that will hopefully be in place uh, to deal with the new infections if there is a second uh, wave. Um, one of my main concerns is with um, co-circulating viruses that are typical in the fall and winter months, um, which you know have overlapping uh, presentations um, for especially the people that have the mild um, COVID-19. And so one of the things that my lab has been thinking about a lot is, um, you know, this is one of the rationales for uh, developing a test that can detect many different viruses, not just SARS-CoV-2, um, because um, if you can find that, you know, we know waves of rhinovirus, you know, go through, um, you know, a company or a housing complex. Um, it's, it will be important, I think, to, to be able to tell the difference and to, to actually make diagnoses of things that we didn't really used to care about diagnosing, like rhinoviruses, um, because of the, you know, the clinical decision making was not affected. But now, if there's a question about COVID-19, uh, I think it is more important to actually detect these types of infections going forward. And I'll just um, add that to the original question, would it be about the virus uh, changing or human behavior? And the virus, luckily, uh, has a pretty low mutation rate compared to other RNA viruses. So um, obviously, we do have some variants arising, but so far, nothing has looked to be um, likely to, to cause a, a, to be the cause of a second wave. Great, thank you all. Um, so Ben, this is a question for you. Tina Say asks, how do you determine that the antibody that you're using is keying in on the coronavirus protein and not the bacteriophage itself? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, that's sort of an experimental question and that involves uh, setting up the appropriate controls. Um, so we do have ways of determining whether someone has reactivities to the bacteriophage itself uh, versus the peptides that are displayed on the virus. Um, but that, that's, a, that's a great technical uh, question that we have to think about. Thank you. Um, so Peter Weiss asks, so Johns Hopkins has been very visible in the role of collecting data about the viral spread worldwide. Um, are any of you involved in that specific effort, and why did Hopkins become such a prominent actor in this area? Uh, was it past experience, particular technology or modeling that we excel at, some other reasons? There's... Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Lisa. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say Lauren uh, Gardner is is not uh, on this panel right now, but um, it was her group that created the the map that has become su such a prominent uh, source of data for um, for people uh, around the world. And so, uh, kudos to her. I I have heard her speak about it, but um, I, I I can't really uh, substitute for that to speak about. Um, whether they had planned to do that in advance. Uh, ben, I, I don't know if, if you have more information about that. No, I don't think it was something they expected to grow into what it eventually became. Um, but I would say that um, there is, um, you know, an excellence in the School of Public Health and, and as well as the School of Engineering um, uh, for this type of activity. And so there have been many um, prominent epidemiologists, I think, you know, actually uh, doing studies uh, that have been very helpful, uh, you know, in, in terms of our understanding of how the virus is spreading and the kinetics of its spreading and uh, other such epidemiological factors. 
Okay, thank you both. Um, I believe that also answers David Shapiro's question, which was how did Hopkins decide to, to put out the go-to mapping site? Um, so hopefully, David, that, that also got to you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, so next, uh, Tina Say asks, um, so uh, this is for you, Lisa. Given the nine lineages that Ben has found and some recent studies from Boston, Northern California, finding multiple introductions, is contact tracing going to be able to find and stop all of the possible infection chains? How can we get on top of this given the large number of new cases each day? Um, well, it's uh, certainly a challenge and you're right to raise the issue of um, the, the challenge that we face because there are so many different um, chains of infection to follow. Um, but I think we have to remember that that is the situation now um, in the midst of, of the pandemic. Um, but it wasn't at the beginning. Um, we, we had an opportunity uh, to do contact tracing, quarantining, and to, to get on top of this. And I think we will again. Um, and so we just have to scale our response uh, to the amount of time that it will take to follow all these threads. And I think it is possible to do. Um, it, it becomes harder when we have large scale contacts like, um, uh, like the protests, for instance, where um, you know, if you identify a case and then find that people have been in contact with that many uh, individuals, you're obviously not going to know their names or be able to tell them. But, but even in those scenarios, it's helpful because you can do group notification. And, um, and we saw that actually at the beginning, too, where there were some notifications of entire uh, groups at a convention or, um, uh, or whole church groups or other, uh, other uh, groups of people who collectively were notified that there may be a risk. And that's where testing comes in again, of course. And Carolyn, do either of you have anything to add to that too? Or I mean, the the fact that there are um, variants, genetic variants, in different ancestral lineages, in theory, can be of assistance. Like I mentioned, in uh, tracing uh, chains of transmission, um, we haven't used it yet, um, but that's I think because the technology hasn't been there. Um, but I think, you know, that that put, has the potential to be a helpful aspect of this particular pandemic. Okay, okay so Peter Weiss asks, uh, the Washington Post graphs of daily co incidents of new COVID-19 cases as of yesterday show that new cases are increasing rapidly in states such as Texas, South Carolina, Florida, California, and are plateauing rather than diminishing in other states such as Georgia. How much of a risk is there of a strong resurgence of the virus, more like when it first struck the US? By the way, yesterday or the day before, President Trump specifically mentioned South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, the states that were doing well, and other states that and, and that other states should imitate them in terms of opening up. Do you have comments on this? That's a that's a tough one too. <laughs> I I guess my comment would be along the same lines as what I said earlier. You know, I think we need to remain vigilant. We are not out of the woods um, on this uh, transmission yet. And, um, and I would just say again, that it is a number of weeks between the time that behavior change happens and when you see the effect. And I feel that as a broad um, statement, I could say that uh, we are not good as, as humans at linking cause and effect when a number of weeks are, are intervening between the cause and the effect. And so uh, we really have to realize, um, like I said earlier, that I, I believe it could be as long as six to eight weeks uh, before you really see enough chains of transmission and cycles of transmission and people getting sick enough to get into the hospital before um, alarm is raised. And, and then you really need to ask yourself what happened um, you know, in the, in the month to two months before that. So we're not out of the woods yet. Thank you. Um, this is from Jessica Frost. Uh, I know many variables are unknown about SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the, the 
first presentation that, that was highlighted that was helpful. Do, do the researchers and panelists have thoughts about findings from preliminary research, such as studies that show associations with blood type, genetic risks, such as Alzheimer's or androgens? Are the surprising EHR findings or patterns that haven't been released um, that you think researchers should be following or studying? Um, or alternatively, what tips would you have as panelists for writers following single cell biology research in COVID-19? There's a lot in that one to unpack. So. So maybe we can start off with the first. What about, um, do any of you have thoughts about, uh, you know, findings from research which have said that certain associations like blood type or genetic risks, you know, might have some role? Um, has anything struck you as particularly compelling in this space? I would comment, um, you know, just that there has been a huge amount of information that is being uh, put forward on what are called preprint servers. Um, and so the typical you know, chain of events in science, after you make a discovery, you write about it, uh, it goes through a peer review process and then is published in a journal. Um, and, and so there's been this uh, independent vetting of the information by the peer review process. And in the, in the pandemic, uh, there's been a huge amount of information that has not gone through that process yet that is posted uh, on these preprint servers. And it's been very valuable in many cases, but it has, it's a double-edged sword um, because there have been some studies, um, and I'm not going to point any in particular out, that um, you know, generated a lot of excitement and uh, media attention. Uh, which then in a second wave of, um, you know, people looking a little more closely at the data um, sort of uh, became less excited about. Um, and so I think there's, for journalists in particular, a risk for, you know, what do you believe about these preprint uh, publications? Um, you know, because you sort of have to do the, the peer review. I mean, it's not peer review, but the vetting yourself um, and so I would encourage those folks to reach out um, to um, scientists and ask their opinions and not just take the preprint uh, at face value. I, I would agree with that. And I, I would just add um, from, an epidemi from an epidemiology standpoint that um, we have seen this virus affecting really all ages, and um, it it is it is one that affects everyone. So I did see the study um, uh, about the blood type um, uh, association. I think it's it's interesting. We'll have to see um, further information before we really understand that. But you know, I always think about what you know, practically speaking, what would that mean for a patient? Um, and it certainly may explain some of the um, variation and severity of disease. Um, but what we know so far is that um, it it does affect, as I said, all ages, um, all races. It really um, the the inequities that we've seen, I think, are largely related to socioeconomic status. Um, because and underlying uh, medical conditions which are intertwined um, and um, and to those individuals largely um, in group home settings um, vulnerable populations who are considered essential workers or who have housing situations that don't allow them to socially distance so these are the things we need to focus on um, I'm really glad that the basic science is happening and that we're going to have more answers about some of these genetic determinants. But uh, right now we need to stay focused on, on the things um, that, that we do know and that we can do something immediately about to mitigate the risk. Thank you both. Yeah, I, I would just, I'll just echo, I, Ben, thank you for really bringing up the point, uh, and Lisa, you as well for echoing it about the preprint servers. Um, you know, these are, are it, it, this is really a new model that is fantastic in its ability to very rapidly disseminate information 
to the scientific community and indeed to the public, uh, but they haven't been through, pre through peer review. Um, and uh, if we, as we know, even things that go through peer review don't always stand the test of time. Uh, and this is an, an area that is you know, not just changing by the week or by the day, but sometimes by the hour. Um, and so I think one of the suggestions that Ben made, which is if, you, if you've got a particularly um, interesting paper that you feel, a finding that you feel just really resonates with you and, and bears following up, uh, seek out some other experts to help you evaluate that. Uh, as you all know, there's a lot of jargon in these papers. It can be very difficult to sift through them even for us. <laughs> it can be quite a slog sometimes. Um, so, and, and some of the, the nuances and the details, especially when people are dealing with large data sets and statistical analyses, um, I think it was Lisa mentioned that humans aren't very good at correlation over you know, long periods of time, cause and effect. I would argue humans are really bad innately at statistics. <laughs> um, if you've ever haven't had to take a biostatistics course, uh, you'll realize why we're mostly bad at it innately. Um, so definitely reach out uh, and try to approach others uh, to gain some insights on it. Uh, and bear in mind that it, it may just not hold up um, as, as things are coming. People are very much trying to do the right thing. They're trying to get the data out as soon as they get it. Um, but because there's this rush and this urgency, sometimes that also causes um, mistakes to be made. Okay, so um, moving on then to the, uh, oh, uh, there was one other question. I think, uh, Ben, this might be for you, uh, that, that came from Jessica. Uh, do you have any tips on single cell biology research uh, in COVID-19? I think this is a very exciting field um, that will be very useful in helping us understand the disease. So just um, what is single cell um, analysis? Uh, it's basically the way of, taking measurements and typically many measurements at the single cell level. And so, you know, previous to some recent um, technological developments, people would take like, you know, lung tissue, grind it up and measure gene expression, for instance, on, on a bulk uh, tissue. And, and the, the issue with that is that it convolutes, you know, a lot of different aspects of, the gene expression patterns that are specific to individual cells. And so in the last uh, decade or less than the last decade, the last five years or so, um, there have been some incredible advances in our ability to analyze gene expression patterns in uh, single cells. And there are uh, folks at Hopkins and uh, many other academic institutions that are employing these technologies um, to, to understand you know, the different roles of the different cells uh, in a complex tissue environment um, and you know, which cells are being infected, which cells are uh, responding to the infection and the uh, repertoire of adaptive immune responses that are targeting uh, the virus and all the different pieces of the protein associated with it. Um, so it's a, it's a very timely uh, development of um, single cell analytical technologies uh, that can be now employed uh, to study the virus and the host immune response. Great, thank you. And I will just add that um, actually, Dr. Anthony Rosen, who spoke at the very beginning of uh, this, this boot camp, um, this area of single cell biology research is very, and he's, so he's our vice dean of, of research. So he sort of oversees a lot of the research here at the School of Medicine, both in the clinical and the purely basic side. Uh, this single cell area of research is very much on his radar screen. So um, if you have specific questions, you should interface with media relations and, and reach out to him because I know he would have um, insights yeah, so, as well. Sorry to interrupt you. Just before the pandemic hit, he had established, he had gathered experts from across the institution uh, to establish a single cell initiative. And um, we were in the process of formulating our ideas about how this would work uh, within the institution. It was going to be a cross-departmental initiative uh, to promote and utilize uh, these types of technologies. And then the coronavirus hit 
and we, um, you know, took a break, uh, but then came back together recently and have uh, started to put together ways in which we can use these technologies to study COVID-19 uh, in the meantime. Great. Thank you. Uh, so Peter Weiss asks, uh, this is probably off the wall, but is it possible that getting a flu shot would increase one's vulnerability to getting SARS-CoV-2 infection? I haven't heard any associations uh, put forth like that. Yeah, nor, nor with any, any vaccine of any, si any type, actually, not, not just flu, right? That was my impression as well. Uh, David Sapiro asks, what can we look forward to in terms of determining the duration of any protective effect of surviving COVID-19? That's a great uh, question that is at the forefront of everyone's mind. Um, we have anecdotal evidence from SARS-CoV-1 infected individuals that they had durable uh, immunity uh, over years. Um, and we're now in the process of gathering information about uh, COVID-19 patients. Um, a lot of that work is happening at, at Hopkins. Um, you know, one of the challenges uh, with this is, look, is that the immune response is really happening in the lung and at the mucosal surface there. And we don't really have good access to that tissue. And so we sort of have to use the blood as a surrogate. Um, at least that's what most studies have used so far. And we do see neutralizing activity uh, in um, most people. Um, I think we're tending, at least from what I've seen, to see a little bit less than we would want to see. Um, but we don't know about the, the durability of that yet because there just hasn't been enough time. Um, but my, I'm optimistic that the, you know, less than amazing neutralizing activity that we're seeing in the blood is not a true rep reflection of our immunity and that to, to get at that we would really need to be looking at the uh, secretions in the lung um, and so those are studies that need to happen thank you lisa were you were you also going to chime in on that or no okay <laughs> all right so uh, the last question also from david shapiro um uh, ask, can anyone speak to the net mortality costs of the pandemic in terms of reduced traffic and pollution and travel and non-medical occupational deaths versus virus deaths and postponed medical care deaths? So some of that fits into the public health sphere. Um, I think they may be difficult to tease out. Uh, I think, um, I, I don't know, Lisa, if you would want to con comment on the postponed medical care versus virus deaths and how we, we do hear things about how death rates have really spiked beyond just what say our testing looks like and how, what, what do we take away from that? Is, is that just de people deferring treatment or is that just undiagnosed COVID cases? Um, what kinds of discussions have been going on in the hospital setting? Yeah, definitely. Um, we saw just a, a remarkable drop in our usual patient load at the beginning of the pandemic. And it was one of the most startling things, particularly to our emergency department colleagues um, who said, you know, how I can understand how the elective cases um, evaporated, but where are the heart attacks? You know, where are the people with stroke? Where are the drug overdoses? where you know, trauma, uh, obviously, I guess that uh, would go down if people were not um, out and about. But, um, but we have started to see those patients returning. And I, I will say it's a very real phenomenon that, that people stayed away from the hospital and healthcare, uh, I'm assuming because of fear of the pandemic or because of the stay at home orders and we're reluctant to come. And now when they're presenting, um, there is overall a, a higher level of acuity. So people have suffered by waiting and, um, and they are presenting sicker. And then I think uh, we have seen data that suggests um, that many people did die at home 
uh, of these underlying uh, conditions, presumably. Uh, we, we don't know and may never know uh, what role COVID-19 may have played in that other than causing them to not seek the medical care that they, that they needed. But there's clearly a, a strong interaction there and um, the excess death data, excess mortality data, uh, I think comparing year over year uh, does show that gap between the mortality due to um, that is reported due to COVID-19 